figured it out. I figured it out. From All right. Good evening, everyone. Bruce Beck is the assistant professor of New Testament at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology and the director of the Rel Religious Studies Program at Hellenic College. He has also served since 2003 as the director of the Papas Patristic Institute. Dr. Beck received both his MDiv and THD at Harvard Divinity School, where his area of specialization was in New Testament and early Christianity, along with the history of the interpretation of scripture. Before coming to Hellenic College Holy Cross, Dr. Beck held management positions in financial services and computer software companies, which experience he brings to his role as director of the Papas Patristic Institute and as a full-time member of the faculty of the School of Theology. Dr. Beck's teaching in the area of New Testament bridges the academic study of the Bible with the practical arts of interpreting it in useful ways for the life of the church today. As an example of his integrated pedagogy, he teaches a year-long course that follows the Sunday lectionary readings providing the opportunity for students to practice the rhythm of weekly preparation of sermons and lessons based on exegetical skills taught in his courses. Dr. Beck's written work has highlighted the ways in which liturgical hymnology and patristic homilies can be potent sources for the history of interpretation of scripture. In addition to academic methods and resources, Dr. Beck privileges the patristic inter interpretations of scripture, including hymns and icons, to develop for his students a robust orthodox hermeneutic for preaching and teaching. He also enjoys a fruitful collaboration with the Department of Youth and Young Adults Ministries as it develops an internet resource for young adults to prepare for the Sunday Gospel lesson each week. So uh, we can give a warm welcome. I am very glad to be here. When Father Anthony first asked me to be part of the Orthodoxy on Tap, uh, it was back in February, and this particular topic came to the front of my mind because uh, we as a, a society, just having gone through the election in, in November and uh, the inauguration in January, and it just seemed like words were flying everywhere. People were speaking, the media, politicians, people were speaking in ways that at least my mother would say they just shouldn't be, uh, they shouldn't be saying that. And the word that has come to mind is that there has become a certain permissiveness about what we can say that used to be, have, had restraints. Like we had sort of reins or modesty. And um, even if we thought certain things, we knew not to just speak them as if we could speak whatever even before we thought it, we could just speak whatever that is. And so this evening's context is really, as Orthodox Christians, what, what do we think about words? Because I think that our society does have an effect on us. Uh, when we see our leaders acting in ways that we can't imitate, it does let the reins off a bit and we're, we're, t we're tempted to go, well, if they don't care, then why should I? Is this the new uh, permissive language? The full title tonight is, Do Words Matter? And, they, and then some, some do. That's the answer. Some do. And the reason I say some do is that one of the things that I want to talk about tonight is words that are comforting, and those words matter. But there's another type of words which the New Testament has used the word idle idle words. And idle words don't matter, or they shouldn't matter. Then there are other words that matter, but those are harmful words. And then lastly, there are holy words. And holy words also matter. And I think over, overarching everything that uh, we might say about words, uh, and really sort of the biggest picture I could uh, portray tonight, is that as Orthodox Christians, we're actually uh, imitating Christ, that our, our standard, our go-to portrait of the Christian life is the Son of God himself. And one of the things that, that we uh, say in our classes at Holy Cross time and time again is that scripture and the stories about Jesus are not written from the perspective of the past, but are written, are written for us in the present to read as models 
things aren't just to say history, but rather they're told in such a way that we can imitate. Christ himself said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, he's, of course, talking to his disciples, but we hear him talking to us. We, when he says, come to me, we say, okay, that sounds good. But he, we know he's talking to his disciples. So that's what I mean. Scripture is always talking in the present tense, even though it's talking about the past. And what he says there, and the, re, the reason I picked this passage, he, he says, come to me, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because or that I am gentle and I'm humble in heart. And so if you want to have one description of the words of Jesus, they are gentle. We were talking earlier about when you are the bearers of bad news in, in a corporate setting and people come to expect that you are going to have negative things to say. It's okay to have negative things to say, but that doesn't mean that you can't say it in a gentle way. Um, or as a teacher, you might have some critique to, get, to offer but perhaps we'd start with something positive. It's not just what we say, but also how we say it. One of the things that uh, Jesus displays when he's in a controversy, because one of the things we see in the Gospels is he's, he's getting challenged all the time. Sometimes it says people come up to test him to see if he'll like fall. But one of the things he, he always does is he, gets the, he hears their question, and rather than going, I don't respect your question, or I'm better than that question, he stays in there. For example, right after this uh, passage about take my yoke upon you and I'm gentle, he goes into a synagogue and he sees a person who has a withered hand. And the synagogue president wonders, it's on a Sabbath, and they wonder, are you going to heal this person on the Sabbath or not? He heals the man. And the president says there are six days on which you can heal, but the Sabbath is a day of rest. And rather than Jesus saying, you're all wrong or you don't care about people, he says, he says tell me, which of you doesn't untie your uh, animal on Saturday morning to lead the animal out to be able to eat and drink? Which of you doesn't untie that animal? And of course they say, well, we all, we all do that. And he goes, well, why shouldn't I uh, untie this daughter of Zion? Why all the more, why shouldn't I untie her who has been bound by this problem that she's had? What he did is instead of the, the, instead of the people being angry at him, they left being amazed at him, going, wow, we were thinking this, but he totally countered us. And he totally engaged with us. But he did not get angry at them. He spoke about it. He did what was necessary. He didn't shirk the responsibility. But he also did it with a sense of gentleness. One of the things that we learn from John Chrysostom, St. John Chrysostom, constantly is not just sh showing what Jesus said, but how he said it. He's always talking about his virtue, about how he's patient. Or he, John will make up in his own mind what Jesus could have said, easily what Jesus could have said. But then he said, no, but he didn't say that. He said something different. So I want to say a few things about comforting words at the beginning. One of the first opportunities that I had to, uh, to visit a monastery happened to be in Greece a number of years ago. And I had a, a prolonged stay. I was there for almost 30 days. And it had been a very full experience for me. I was... I just had not had that much time away like that, and I would just, so the last day I was in the library, and I thought I was alone, and I, I was worried about losing everything that I had learned. I would forget it, and I would go back to being just the same person I was, which I didn't want to be. And so I let out this, apparently I let out this deep sigh, and around the corner came this relatively short nun who said, what's wrong? I went, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know anyone was here. And uh, she said, well, what's, are you troubled? And she, she, I said, well, yes, I'm worried about losing things. And she goes, well, haven't you heard the story of the sower and the seed? 
I'm already about to finish my doctorate in New Testament at this point. <laughs> and she's going, haven't you heard the story of the sower and the seed? And I said, well, yes, please tell me about the sower and the seed. And she, she said, well, you know, some seed falls on the hard ground and some falls uh, and grows up quickly, but the sun bakes it and it dies. And some gets choked out with the cares of the world and so forth. But some seed does fall on good ground, and it grows disproportionately fruitful, and it bears so much. So what are you worrying about? God's going to let the seed that needs to grow, it'll grow. <laughs> First of all, I'm just in amazement that she's done this to this parable. And I, you know, I said, what? Uh, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Um, because the soil is supposed to be four different people, but she put all four soils in me. Uh, so I was amazed at that, first of all. But secondly, I still am amazed at how she brought that particular word at that particular time, which is exactly what I needed to hear, even though it's totally not how the parable is told by Jesus. It was the word for me. And it was a word of comfort. And she was not meddling in my business. I had made this very loud sigh. And she was responding. So I was in her space, and she came and said, can I help you? What's wrong? And if I had said, no, sister, she would have gone, wonderful. But I did tell her, and she gave me that. So sometimes, sometimes we are in a place where we can offer a, a word of comfort. Uh, one of the things that uh, Paul says, St. Paul says it in chapter 2 of Philippians, uh, Philippians is largely a, a letter that's trying to, to quiet down some disunity. There's people who are, have created f factions. And usually when they're factions, it's caused by words. Uh, words is, are the quickest way to get things to break apart uh, between people. And Paul says in the beginning of Philippians 2, he says, If there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any uh, common fellowship in the spirit, any compassion, any sympathy, make my joy complete. And he almost doesn't finish his sentence here because he goes on to another verb, be of the same mind. But what he means to say is make my joy complete. Speak like that. Say things like that. Emphasize the end of the spectrum of positive uh, speaking rather than the the part of the spectrum which is all the things that are wrong with everybody. But he says, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And then he goes on to talk about have the mind among you that Christ has when he, though he was in the form of God, he emptied himself and took on flesh. So he puts Jesus as the last example of what it means to go low. And he uses the word uh, humility, that he, he goes low. And so one of the things that we learn is that sometimes there's a lot at stake when we're talking with people. But we never have to lose the gentleness. We never have to go big. One of the rules that my wife and I uh, established, and I hope she doesn't mind me talking about this, either one of us could say, let's stop this conversation at this point because we were getting too heated in an argument. And it has been a wonderful uh, safety valve because if someone had the wisdom to go, if we continue this, it's going to just get worse. So let's, let's stop now and let's come back and then we'll finish this. But we'll finish it when we're not so heated and we have some perspective. And sometimes, when things are really good, the first thing that one of us says is not, let's continue, but I'm sorry. When things are really good, that's the way the conversation starts with the second time. It doesn't always happen that way. But I think that gentleness, not losing control of our emotions, although that sometimes happens, is important because that's when damage can get done. The last thing I'll say about this is that one of the prayers that we can have in our, in our lives is for us to have eyes and ears for, for people who we can help. We don't want to be meddling in other people's business. 
but sometimes a comforting word or just just saying thank you to someone going out of our way to be kind sometimes that's a very important important thing idle words one of the things that is uh, very true in uh, but sometimes overlooked in the New Testament is that Jesus speaks a great deal about it's not just what you do where sort of sin begins, but sin actually begins much earlier in how we our, our thoughts and including our words. In chapter 12, he speaks about the way in which our inside, our inner life mirrors our outer life. And he says that uh, if, I'll just read this passage to you, it's very short. This is chapter 12, verse 33. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person brings good things out of a good treasure, and the evil person brings evil things out of an evil treasure. I tell you, on the day of judgment, you will have to give an account for every careless word you utter. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. This is a very disturbing passage because we say words all the time that we wish that we uh, could take back. The word here for careless uh, is... Uh, the word that more literally means idle. It's the same word that uh, you, you recall the story of the uh, master that goes to the marketplace to hire uh, laborers and he gets some, a group of laborers at the first hour but he goes back at the third and the sixth and the ninth and finally the eleventh hour and he asks the people at the eleventh hour why have you been idle here all day? And he goes, and they say, no one has hired us. They have a good answer. But this idea of being idle is what this word careless means. And the reason that it's important is that idle conveys something very different than just making a mistake. Idle means that it had no good purpose. It wasn't something that was trying to be productive, but rather it was... It wasn't going anywhere. It was wasted. An example of idle speech would be gossip, where it's not going anywhere. It's not doing anyone any good. It's not productive. In, in fact, it, it's negative. It, it tears down. So uh, idle words brings to mind the idea that we actually are at work with our Christian lives. And we're at work in our mission as representatives of Christ. And so everything, everything is useful. And nothing's idle, so that the goal in speech is to make our words, uh, as, as Paul says, make our words like uh, salt, uh, to be a flavor, to be preservatives, to heal. Salt in, it still heals. <laughs> we don't think of it that way, but it, it, salt hasn't changed. Uh, <laughs> salt still heals. To, to have our speech be productive or efficacious or admonition, ad, ad, admonishing, and when our words are just going into places that we're not actually supposed to be, that would be an example of idle speech. One thing that I did want to say before we feel like we're hopeless is that St. John Chrysostom commented on this very, very high standard because one of the things that we, we treasure in the Orthodox tradition is we have scripture, but we also have the whole patristic tradition. And he reads this uh, in a very useful way, I think, and that is he realizes and just says to his people, we're going to say idle words. And so we are going to give an account to God for that. But one of the, th the thing that he emphasizes here is that this should help us when we realize that, we're, that we do that, then it will help us to have more humility and patience when someone else says something really bad to us or when we hear something bad going on. So basically, it, gives, it helps us to not judge. If God's holding us to the standard of watch your words, guard your heart, then if we realize that we can't really keep that standard, then we're going to actually, we don't want to be judged by that standard either, so let's not judge our neighbor when they say something wildly offensive 
Why are we flying off at them? Are we willing to have God fly off on our words? Because that's what we're, we're going to have to be giving an account, is what the scripture says. And by the way, giving an account is not the same thing as being punished. It just means you have to go, yeah, I did that, sorry. <laughs> You're right, that was, a bad, that was a bad word. Giving an account is accountability. It's a very pastoral kind of takeaway here is that when we realize that the standard is that the words are supposed to be useful, then it helps us to ask forgiveness uh, when our words aren't that way and also to not judge others when they're not perfect. I want to make a brief connection to a prayer that we're all familiar with, prayer of St. Ephraim the, the Syrian, because some of these words about idleness are in the Lenten uh, prayer. Uh, as you all are very familiar, the prayer goes, O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, faint-heartedness, lust of power, and idle talk, but give rather the spirit of uh, chastity, humility, patience, and love to thy servant. Yea, Lord and King, grant me to see my own errors and not to judge my brother. For thou art blessed unto ages of ages. Amen. All four of these first words that we ask to be taken away from us, the spirit of sloth, faint-heartedness, lust, and power, all of these words can be used with regard to speech, to words themselves. So that the um, argia is the word in Greek for the first one. It literally means idleness. And... Idleness is when you are neglecting your own work. We all have work because the prayer says, Vespota, master. And if he's our master, then we're his servant. And servants have work to do. So the prayer is really trying to remind us that our lives are not our own. We're not just like, I, what am I going to do today? That we have a master. And our lives are in accordance with the will of that master. So when we go into our gia, idleness, we're no longer working for the master. We're like vacationing, which is not a bad thing in itself. So we're on strike from the master. When we go on into the sort of this, no longer asking, what am I doing for the Lord? What do you want me to do, Lord? Then we can go to the next word, which is peri ergia. And peri ergia, which sounds very similar to argia, is a excess superfluity, doing things more than one needs to. But in the case of speech, it has to do with meddling with other people's business. In other words, doing more than you're supposed to, or speaking more than you're supposed to, going on and on. Which leads to the third word, which is the love, the love of ruling others, philarchia. Philarchia is to, to love to rule. And when it comes ruling over others in speech, it might be dominating a conversation, but it also may be poking in where the person really doesn't need help. It's wonderful to ask people, how are you doing? But sometimes we may over-assert ourselves. One of the things that I really appreciated about being in the monastery is that even though they had so many resources, they were so spiritually mature, they never initiated the spiritual conversation. They let us ask for a question, like, I need help with this. Then they would speak, but they would not initiate. They would wait for us to ask. And that reserve, that modesty, really respects language. It, really res it has a certain economy, one which I, I really appreciate. I know when we're in the world, we're surrounded by words and sounds all the time. But that modesty, I think, is something that we see in the Orthodox uh, phronima, the mindset, is that we do tend to carry ourselves more modestly as a religious group, I think, because of, of some of this uh, teaching. The last thing, the last part of the prayer is the word argologia, which again uses the word idle, idle chatter. Log logia, like the word lo um, loquacious, and it means to speak a lot. And so idle chatter is unnecessary words. So this prayer, although not intentionally being all about speech, really applies all of it, to having a sense of mission from the master and kind of being aware of what would be useful and perhaps not speaking quite as much or being more gentle when we do 
have to speak. Father Shmem has a wonderful thing on Idle Talk that's uh, readily available on various websites. He was talking about that words can either be poison or they can be healing. Words can go either way. Part of it is, you know, being able to speak a word in season. Another uh, example of words being uh, harmful, and this is another uh, teaching of Jesus, which is in the Sermon on the Mount, is that he redefines or creates another telling of the commandments of the Lord. And in our own Orthodox tradition, we see that it's actually Christ who, the Logos, who gives the first uh, commandments to Moses. It's not just God giving to Moses, but Christ himself, pre-incarnate, is involved in the giving of the first uh, set of commandments. So there's no war between, you know, Christ's commandments and the Ten Commandments from Moses. We really shouldn't talk about them as Moses' commandments. They're really Christ's commandments that were given to uh, Moses for the first uh, covenant. But what happened with the incarnation is that a new covenant was made, and new covenant needs new, new laws, new commandments. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, he gave six examples of how the bar has actually been raised from what it was to what it is. And the first one he said is that, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, uh, don't even get angry with your brother and don't call your brother or sister fool. He actually says that if you want to stop murder out here, you start it by not calling people violent things. You, you stop violence early by catching it in your speech. And if you catch it in your speech, then you're, you're not going to get to the point where you get violent with guns and things that cause harm. So it's not just within, the, within Orthodox Christianity, but within the actual teachings of Jesus that we have this, the heart matters, the words matter, and that our line of defense starts there. We really want to kind of make that the, the line and fight it there. We're not going to win always there, but if that's where we draw the line to fight our thoughts and words, then we're much, much less likely to go and do something really stupid because the, we, we've drawn the line much earlier. And again, as John Chrysostom said, we're much more aware of our sinfulness if we draw our line there rather than saying, oh, I'm a pretty good person. I don't kill anyone. I don't lie that much. You really want to kind of draw it closer and go, wow, you know, every day I need God's grace and help to live a Christ-like life. One of the things, especially for, for younger people that's coming up today, is this is a dialogue that's happening very, very actively on college campuses today, is that uh, to be aware that some things that used to be okay to say and talk about in general, teachers and, the, and administration have to be careful because some people have had experiences that certain language can be, uh, the, some of the words are like triggering, uh, some people have had trauma in certain areas. Certain things are no longer um, uh, just to be publicly said. And the debate is, you know, are we supposed to be uh, protecting people who've had special experiences that are oversensitive or more sensitive than others? This is an ongoing uh, debate in college. With regard to that sensitivity for the Orthodox Church, is that one of the things that we learn with, with the fact that Christ became incarnate is that he came all the way for us, came all the way to the condition that we were in, where we were. And so um, one of the things that that means is that when we're with someone, uh, we need to be Christ for them. In other words, we need to be everything that they need. So if they have sensitivities around certain language or if, if there's something that's important to them and we don't actually support it necessarily, but it's important to them, that kind of giving them that extra uh, humility and go, well, if this is what you need today, I'm going, to, I'm going to speak with that sensitivity. I'm not going to go, I don't believe in that or whatever. We really are wanting to be able to communicate, to comfort, to, to be the help that people need and not hold on to our rights or our, uh, what we necessarily think because we're, again, we're the servant and Christ is the master. In other words, we're on a mission for him. And so uh, sometimes that means for us to become, as Paul says, all things for all people, 
that we might save some. And uh, that humility is not easy, but language sometimes needs to be contextualized for the people that we're talking to. Just as when we're talking to our children when they're young, we talk in a language that they can understand and we get down with them. So language needs to, as much as it can, modulate to the people that we're talking to. Because that's the whole purpose of language, is to communicate. And that's hard, I mean, that's not easy because we all have our own vocabulary. It's not easy for me to talk to high school students, for example. It's been a long time since I was a high school student. And because I teach at uh, graduate school, it's a real emptying experience to get there. But I do know that that's what the goal is, is to be, be who they need me to be uh, in that moment. Because that's, that's the model that we have by Christ. I'll just end with what you already know to be true, is that the words of Scripture, holy words, matter tremendously because we in fact call it the Word of God. And so really the, the Scripture is the highest example of how words can be transformative because they're inspired and God actually is present with us when we ask Him to be there to help us read and interpret so that we can be fed by Scripture. So words really do matter in that God in fact has given his wisdom in words uh, in Scripture. And the Orthodox Church is absolutely never ending with its services of reading Scripture uh, in the Sundays and in all the services. We're always reading Scripture. And that tells us that, that those kinds of holy words matter. And as we are changed by those words, we can actually be a changing agent uh, for those that we come in touch with. I know this to be true, is the more we read scripture, the more our own language when we help others, the more our language starts to take on that kind of sensitivity. It's just like learning a language. You start to think in those ways. Uh, and you never know, like the nun that helped me, you never know when the word is actually scripture coming back, <laughs> coming back in a new way <laughs> for us. Um, because she had internalized the scripture so well that when it came back for me, it was a new word, but it was from scripture. And so I think that's a good place to end. Thank you all. It's really nice to be here.